Hi, this is Mike Jansen, producer of the Storytelling Series. In this episode, we get to know Indianapolis attorney Jim Voiles. Jim has had an incredible law career, representing high-profile clients, including boxer Mike Tyson, former Indiana University basketball coach Bob Knight, former Colts punter Pat McAfee, and former Indiana Pacers Stephen Jackson and Jamal Tinsley. Jim discusses his realization and evolution of the power of storytelling in the courtroom. Here's Jim Boyles. I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1943. Uh, my father was in the military, World War II. Didn't see him until 1946 when he got out of the military. And uh, we lived in Indianapolis. I went to uh, school here at School 70. Um, then my father decided to be going back in the military, but while he was here, he went to law school for a year. Uh, then got called back into the military and went into the Selective Service Division, the U.S. Army. We moved to Michigan City, and I finished my uh, sixth through my ninth grade there. Uh, they then moved Fifth Army Headquarters from Chicago, where it was, to Springfield, Illinois. So we moved to Springfield, Illinois, uh, where I finished my high school went to college in Illinois, and then came back here in 1964 to go to law school. I've had a great life. I had wonderful parents uh, and uh, very involved with me and uh, pretty much let me do kind of what I wanted to do. I had my friends. Uh, we were really involved in uh, auto really automobile racing. It happened early on for me. My uncle, George Ober, who was with me at this firm, uh, George was president of the, uh, in, and uh, was one of the founders of the United States Auto Club in 1955. So I kind of got my love and interest of auto racing from here and from him. Uh, he was a lawyer. Uh, he was a jazz musician player. And so I, I mean, I kind of gravitated to those areas. Uh, I've seen every Indianapolis 500 but one since 1953 and so and when we were growing up uh, the, the guys I hang around with and still do there's 14 of us who have been friends since 1957 and we see each other every two years at a reunion that we stage at different locations in the country and then uh, matter of fact we're all going on a fishing trip in Wisconsin in September uh, one of them whom was CEO of Cargill world's largest privately held company and, and, and doctors, lawyers. It's just kind of a unique group of guys and we're in touch with each other all the time. I'll talk to them three or four times a month. And uh, we had a, a, a car fetish and so we worked on cars, we built hot rods, we built all kinds of stuff. And so that's kind of continued in my life. Well, it's funny. Uh, I mean, with my involvement in cars, I mean, I always kind of thought I'd like to be a race driver. Uh, and uh, th that was kind of a theme for me for a long time until my dad told me we were going to go to law school. We weren't going to go drive race cars. Um, but that was primarily the two that I really kind of thought about. Uh, I thought a lot about automobiles. And then as I got older, into high school, I was directed by my dad, I would come over to Indianapolis and spend time with my uncle. Uh, and particularly when I was in college, we had a lot of correspondence back and forth, he and I. In my summer vacations, my grandparents lived here, my mother's parents, and so we would come over here uh, and spend time. And one of my dearest friends in Indianapolis turned out to be Mike Gaio, who is an FBI agent. He's my oldest friend. We met in first grade. And uh, Mike's an FBI agent and now retired. Uh, and so coming back to Indianapolis and seeing my uncle and uh, having him take me over to the courthouse, come to the office, just kind of instilled in me the interest in, and his pictures behind me uh, with uh, his secretary. So. Uh, I think when I was in uh, starting college, that it was pretty definitive for me that that's what my direction w wanted to be. Uh, I was kind of a uh, substandard student in high school. We had more interest in football, uh, young women, 
and cars. And so that uh, it showed itself on my lack of academic achievement in high school. Um, but as I got into college, I had to focus and we started really kind of, and my parents always very subtly, never directly, my dad and my uncle thought that the practice of law would be a good thing for me. And that's how it happened. I don't think there, I mean, I took a speech class, but I never really thought about storytelling in and of itself. To me, life is a story. And so I, I kind of looked at uh, my experiences as I was growing up, as my experiences in college. Kind of interesting, I worked my way through college. I worked at the Illinois School for the Blind. Uh, there was a dorm there and there were about seven of us and we got free room and board, um, and we took care of the blind students. We had different roles, some were in recreation, some were in the kitchen, uh, and so, I mean, I just am pretty intuitive about people around me, about life, about uh, funny things that happen, and, and so I, I think all of us have the capacity to tell stories. Uh, if you just kind of pay attention to life around you and if you're interested in people. I, I think the thing about practicing law is I'm fascinated by the people I meet. I've been blessed to meet a lot of wonderful people, uh, a lot of interesting people, a lot of crazy people. I mean, I've seen it all in my career. And, and so those are, it's almost like the embryonic stage of a story as you meet people and you see and develop things in their life so that you can relate them to others. understanding about storytelling came very subtly. Um, and I, I think one of the uh, kind of the areas where I thought more about it was um, a book I read that Jerry Spence had written. Um, and I, I know, I mean, I've been at uh, an event with uh, Mr. Spence when we went to his, uh, a thing he put on in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, as a member of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. We had a meeting there and he was there and we talked, but m my feeling is that we started developing it, or I personally started developing it more in opening statements. In other words, the prosecution in a criminal case starts by giving their side or their version of the case. Uh, and very often jurors uh, who don't maybe want to be there. It's a very difficult case. And so you're trying to capture their attention early on before you spend two or three days listening to the prosecution's evidence before you can ever get to our evidence. Um, and so I think it's important in the opening statement to tell your story. In other words, you've got an individual there, man or woman, uh, and you want to tell to the jurors how they ended up here, why they ended up here, under what circumstances, the positive things that you want the jurors to look at and watch for during the course of the trial. And, and so that's where, it, it used to be that the opening statement from the defense was, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you have to pay attention to what the state says. Uh, you have to subtly look at all their issues. And we were kind of getting away from trying to capture the jurors' attention at the beginning about our story. And so that's kind of where I started paying attention to it uh, and how important it was. And that's kind of been Spence's theme over the years of storytelling, uh, t t telling the story of your client. I mean, to me, there's two concepts. I mean, storytelling is reading a book uh, that somebody else has written that, uh, like you sit down and read nursery rhymes to your children or your grandchildren. But we're really now taking a story, a person's life, and developing it in front of other people to get them empathetic into the story, how they got into the situation that they are in now, and how they could be excused for their conduct for whatever it was. So that's where it becomes important. I think the most interesting part of it is, is the diversity. 
one day I'm going to be in an arson case. Uh, tomorrow I may be in a murder case. Uh, the day after that I may be in a securities fraud case. So I, I'm constantly getting different things presented to me. Uh, and then I really like the dissection of them, the, the preparation, getting really knowledgeable about the case. Um, and I've always been fascinated by medicine. I'm, there could have been a turn for me years and years ago that I wanted to be a doctor. So I'm really into the forensic part of cases and I, I enjoy, uh, I tried a case in uh, New Jersey for four months, a murder case, and it really pretty much turned on the pathological uh, evidence that we were able to develop for the juries that um, could see the difference in how uh, a pathologist could have possibly made a mistake in their analysis of the case. And, and so that that's really uh, a great part of what I like doing in these cases. I had a, uh, a good experience in a, a case that I tried um, that involved recreating after 30 years an event um, that happened and uh, it was more about the forensic part and telling a story through forensics uh, that we were able to do and, and I thought that that was probably one of the finest opportunities that I had. I had a wonderful uh, co-counsel on a case that was out of state and that we were able to weave this event that had happened 30 years before um, and put it kind of back into perspective for the jurors at the time. And I think that was probably one of the best chances I got to tell a story over a long protracted period of time that took a lot of detail to convince them ultimately that the client wasn't guilty. The foundation uh, for good storytelling in the courtroom, in my opinion, is to really have a story that has an attachment to a juror personally. They have to be able to have some life experience and that they can relate to what you're going to tell them um, so that they can absorb it in their own world, in their own life, and how that these events could possibly have happened. And then they're being asked to excuse some conduct on behalf of a defendant that others might say, you know, that's really bad and that's criminal. But in order to get to the point where a group of 12 people are going to excuse the conduct and say they don't believe that that is enough to prove somebody guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, they've got to be understanding the circumstances, the person, and being able to kind of put it into their own perspective of how they could do that. And if we find ourselves in that circumstance, we might have done the same thing. My evolution of storytelling over the years, I think, has gotten uh, more attention from me because, one, I have gotten older, two, I have tried more cases, and I think, three, I just kind of paid more attention to that part of it. And as I said, a few years ago, I really began developing uh, in my own mind that the important opening statement and telling the story from day of the first time you get a chance to speak to the jury and carrying that theme throughout the trial is important. I, I think people connect with storytelling for a number of reasons. A, we're all living a story. We have our own family story. We have our own family history. We have our friends' stories. We, have, we, we spend our day listening to stories. I'll listen to a client's story. I'll listen to things that happen in the office. I'll listen to my partners, things that happen to them in court and other things. And it's kind of like a, a collage of information that comes to us every day. 
and being able to then express it and make someone else interested in it, they're automatically interested in it because they have their own story and they're interested in your story. And why? Because we sit around all the time and we tell stories to each other, uh, whether it's in a joke form or whether it's serious stories about events that have happened. Uh, and, and so that's the, it's the form of communication between human beings that I think is the essence of what we do and what we are. Because if we, if you're a trial lawyer, what you really learn to do better than anything is listen. Uh, because when I'm getting ready to cross-examine somebody, I already know pretty much what I'm gonna ask them because I've read their testimony, I've seen their statements. But in the courtroom, I'm now really keyed in to what they're saying and how they may change their story a little bit from here, a little bit from there, in order for me to develop, well, wait a minute, you're, you're really not telling it the way you told it before, so is there a reason you're coloring it a little now than you didn't when you told the police this story? And so I, I think that, and we're all fascinated in everyday life by other people's events and stories and what's happened to them because we're empathetic to each other.